is that anybody here has never been surprised? 48 years ago. Yeah, yes, Billy West, I can still remember 48 years ago. 48 years ago, I drove through a snowstorm to see Joyce. I drove on treacherous Highway 55, wasn't like it is today, from Durham to Bowie's Creek. It's a crazy thing to do driving in a snowstorm. But I wasn't going to let a snowstorm mess up my surprise for Joyce. I was a man on a mission. My mind was made up. I had something very important I wanted to ask her and something precious I wanted to give to her. And I wasn't going to let a snowstorm prevent me from doing what I had been planning for weeks to do. By the time I arrived in Bowie's Creek, there was between six to eight inches of snow on the road. And Joyce was wearied sick all day. While we planned to get together that day, she didn't think we would. And when she tried to call me, she didn't get a response, and she was struck with fear. You've got to remember, that was the day before cell phones. Where was John? Was he foolish enough to drive in this snow? You see, what was normally a one-hour drive took three and a half hours. She was surprised to see me when I arrived. I mean, she was worried and, and it's uncertainly uh, filled with fear, but her fear turned into joy. We ate dinner with Lena Stewart, the lady she had rented a room from and was staying with as she taught her first year in Dunn High School. After dinner, Joyce and I slipped into the living room. We sat on the couch. And as we were talking, really as she was talking, I slipped my hand into my pocket and I had a little box and I flipped it open and I brought a ring out and I grabbed her hand and slipped it on her finger and her eyes widened, and her mouth dropped open, and she was completely speechless, surprised, astonished, mission accomplished. It seemed like it would be forever she would speak again, the only time I've seen Joyce that speechless. What began as a day of fear and disappointment turned into an evening of utter joy and surprise. And Easter was something like that. An anticipated dreadful day of preparing a dead body and the scary ordeal of an empty tomb turned into a day of utter surprise and joy. Listen to how Mark records this event in his gospel got your Bibles, turn to it, Mark 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they might go anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way through the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on a right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He was risen. He is not here. See the place where they lay him? But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Would you pray with me? Father, this is your day. Help us to capture not only the wonder and the surprise of it, 
but will you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to each of us in areas where we may need to be reassured, reaffirmed, and comforted, where we need hope. I realize I have no power in my words, but you have power in your spirit. And I do believe you have something you want all of us to know and to touch base with and to affirm. May that happen today as we give ourselves to you as we listen to your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What do you think those three women were talking about as they made their way early that Sunday morning to the tomb? Mark tells us what the biggest concern was for them. Uh, They were concerned about that large stone that had been rolled in place in front of the the grave where Jesus' body was put. What about that stone? It's a big old thing. How in the world will we ever be able to move it? You know, Mary, maybe we're just wasting our time. We may not even be able to get to Jesus. Oh, well, at least we could say we tried. Wouldn't you know it? We couldn't even find the men. They scattered like a covey of quails. Hmm, men. They're never there when you need them. Well, what do you think they were expecting? Ah, yes, we'll get there and the Lord will be gone. Better hurry up. You know, he's going to rise this morning. Not hardly. They were concerned about a stone and expecting a tough time getting into the tomb. Uh, Maybe they could budget just enough to slip in, or maybe they couldn't there was no way for them to really know what they expected to find. An open tomb? A missing Jesus? You've got to be kidding. That that wasn't what they were thinking. And I want you to look closely at this story. There is something there that may surprise you. Every, Every time I read the story, it really amazes me. When the women discovered the the open door and the empty tomb, There were no hallelujahs. There were no praise the Lord's. There were no spontaneous gasps. Uh, There were no, oh, yes, they cried. Oh, no. We want our Easter's to be a joyous occasion, and we dress it up. We do everything imaginable to make this a happy day. But the prevailing mood of that first Easter wasn't joy at all. I mean, did you see it? Did you hear it in the story? It was fear. The women were afraid, and and it got worse. Look at verse 5. They stepped in the tomb, and in the cool darkness, they encountered an angel. Mark says it was a young man dressed in white, but Matthew tells us it was an angel. And look, he says, they were alarmed. And this was a very perceptive angel, for he said right off, Don't be alarmed. Notice, he didn't say, Come and rejoice with me. He said, Don't be alarmed. Why? Because the women were afraid. Then he delivered the most alarming news of all. You're looking to Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He, he, he's not here. He's risen. Then he pointed to place. See that place where he laid? And, and it was evident behind what's not said, it was empty. And the angel said, he went on ahead of you to Galilee, and then you will see him as he told you. Now, did that settle those ladies' nerves? Did that calm their spirits? Not on your life. They ran out of there as fast as their feet could carry them. It says, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and they fled the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. I was looking at Easter cards. It's amazing the kind of Easter cards they have today. Cards to moms and pops, grandmas and granddads, family, uh, all kinds of things. Lots of cards for kids. 
But did you know I did not see one card with a picture on the cover with three women, their skirts gathered up in their hands, running for their lives? You know, but that's probably the best image of that first Easter. And sometimes I wonder if we haven't lost something of the fear and surprise of our faith. We made Jesus a little too common. We made him too much our bosom buddy. We made him a little too predictable. We no longer stand in fear of his judgment or in amazement of his power or or in wonder of what he's going to do. No longer do we meet a risen Savior, much less be surprised by what he's doing. No longer do we seem to be surprised about anything about Jesus. But the heart of the Easter story is a story of fear and awe and wonder and surprise. In this story, Jesus lets us know that he goes on ahead of us. Isn't that comforting to know? He goes on in head. Where are you going this week? He goes on ahead of you, and we will see him again. The Easter event lets us know that God has the last word. All three women, as they made their way to the graveyard, the last thing they expected to see was an empty tomb. They watched Jesus die. They saw the soldiers as they pierced his side and and they watched as they lowered his lifeless body down from the cross and they followed as they carried his dead body to the grave. They helped lay his body in the tomb and they were there when they probably themselves put his lifeless arms over his chest. They had seen death before, and they knew Jesus was dead. But because it was approaching sundown and the Sabbath was about to begin, they would just have to wait till Sunday morning to properly wrap and perfume his lifeless body. I mean, they had done this for other families. They were acquainted with death. They just assumed, as before, death had the last word. From where we sit this morning, it appears that our own mortality is inevitable. Everything must live and everything that dies is done and over with. But the angel said, he is risen. Since Jesus is risen from the dead, then death doesn't have the last word. God does. How how does that strike you? The Apostle Paul put it this way. Listen to him. Listen. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up into victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to ask you to do something for me. It won't hurt you. I'd like for you to look out of the corner of your eye and sneak a peek at the person to your left. Can you do that? You got that done? Good. Now listen. I'm going to tell you about that person who's sitting over there and that person who's sitting over here. That person's going to die. Shh. Don't tell them. They may not like it. 
Oh, okay, let's do something else. L look out of the corner of your right eye and sneak a peek at the person who's on your right. You got that peek at that person? Well, that person is going to die. Now, don't tell them. Whew. Let's just keep that between us. You see, the person on your left and the person on your right is terminal. That's not good news, but I got even worse news. The person sitting right between the person on your left and the person on your right, they are terminal too. And that's you, my friend. We're all terminal. And I'm not trying to be morbid. I'm just telling the truth. We all are going to die. Sooner or later, we'll probably find ourselves in a room filled with flowers and people whispering as they talk. Are you afraid of death? Many people are, you know. But Easter deals with that fear because God has the last word. Max Lucado tells about a missionary in Brazil who discovered a, a tribe of Indians in a remote village. Uh, they lived near a large river, and the tribe was friendly and in need of medical attention. Uh, you see, there, there was a contagious disease that was going through their community, and people were dying every day. And an infirmary was located in another part of the jungle, and the missionary decided the only thing he could do to help that tribe was to get them to go to the hospital for treatment and inoculation. In order to reach the hospital, however, the Indians had to cross a river, a feat they were unwilling to perform. You see, the river, they believed, was inhabited by evil spirits, and to enter the water meant certain death. So the missionary set about the difficult test of trying to help them overcome their superstition. He explained that he had crossed the river and he had arrived unharmed, but no luck. He, he led people to the, the bank of the river and he put his hands in the river and they just looked at him and they didn't believe him. He walked out into the river and splashed water onto his face to try to show it was safe, but it didn't do anything for them. You see, he didn't know what to do. And he looked up to heaven and he thought, and he looked at the bank and he dove in the river. He swam underneath the river and he came up on the other side. And having proved that the superstition was a farcus, he punched his hand into the air as a sign of victory. And all the Indians began to applap and claw. And you know what? They crossed the river. Jesus saw people enslaved by their fear of a cheap power. He explained that the river of death was nothing to fear. He said things like, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. The people wouldn't believe him. He touched a, a boy and called him back to life. But the believers were still unconvinced. Uh, he whispered life in the dead body of a girl. But the people were still cynical. He led a dead man named Lazarus spend four days in a grave, and he called him out. Is that enough? No. For him, it was necessary to enter the river, to submerge himself into the water of death before people would believe that death had been conquered. But after death, he came out on the other side of the river, and it was time to sing, and it was time to celebrate. That is the surprise of Easter. Jesus Christ is risen. 
He has been to the other side of death, and he's come back to let us know there is nothing to be afraid of. Yesterday I had a funeral for a lady in Ashboro. She was 97 years old. She was an avid Carolina fan since 1957. She had been a member of the Lion, uh, of the Rams Club. She uh, lived and breathed Carolina. She called me this past December and talked with me. She said, Pastor, I miss you because I don't have anybody to talk Carolina about. And she said, you know, they'd win if they'd make their free throws. At the end of her funeral, they played the Carolina song. But the thing she wanted more than anything was to be buried on a Sunday. And out of consideration for people spending time with family, the family said, we'll do it on a Saturday. And I think she would agree. And she wanted a Sunday because she knew that though this 97-year-old body faded away, I'm going to be more alive than I've been ever in my life because death does not defeat us. It is not the end. See, Easter lets us know that God has the last word, a glorious word, a wonderful word, an awe-inspiring word, a powerful word, a word of promise, a word of hope, a word of eternal life. Well, you see, Easter lets us know that we serve a risen Savior who's in the world today, and he goes on ahead of us to lead the way. Now, isn't that something to sing about? Isn't that something to shout about? Isn't that something to tell other people about? Isn't that something to just say, hallelujah? Let's pray together. Father, we know this story so well, but we many times forget that you are living here with us, that you go ahead of us. There's nowhere we can go, nowhere we can be where you're not already there. Even when we face the darkest, most dismal time of our life, there can always be a resurrection. Some of us have lost loved ones in the past year. But for those who are in Christ, we just know it's a transition for them to spend eternity with you. Lord, as we worship you this day, Help us to know that we do serve a risen Savior, that you are in this world today. For we ask this in the precious, the bold, the never-ending, the most powerful name in the world, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I want to invite us to exclaim our faith as we stand and sing hymn number 368, He Lives. And as we do this, if there's something you need to give to Him, make right with Him, or if God wants you to be part of this church, you can make that known today. But if you are in Christ and you know Him, we have all the reason to be grateful. We have all the reasons to sing from the top of our lungs, He Lives, He Lives. Can we join to that and proclaim that today?